Welcome to Tent Talk, the podcast with Nancy McCrady, where we talk about life under the big tent of God's presence and the provoking process of discipleship. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Tent Talk. This is Nancy McCrady. The greatest spiritual smoke show is about to happen, and you don't want to miss out by being enveloped in shame and in how things may appear outwardly or your physical appearance. You don't want to know Jesus according to some false uh, physical picture that you've seen. You want to know Him and you want to live in Him during these days. Take a listen. I think you're going to really, really like this episode. Love you all. I was recently at a surprise birthday party for a dear friend, and her granddaughter was the one putting it on. And as we were sitting there waiting for my friend to arrive so that we could surprise her, I talked with the granddaughter who had lovingly selected certain pictures of her grandmother, had them out in the centerpieces of the tables, And as I was looking at them, I found one of when my friend was much younger. And I said to the granddaughter, these are so fantastic. These are great looking pictures. And so I showed her this one of her grandmother. And she said, I know, she's such a smoke show. And I said, wait just a minute, wait a minute. She's a what? (laughs) And this young granddaughter in her early 20s said of her grandmother, who was in her mid-70s, Yes, she's a smoke show. And I said, what does this word mean? I mean, because immediately I was just gripped with uh, the sound of it. And she said, well, it means that she's really hot. And so with great love and great honor and respect and fun, the granddaughter was saying that my grandmother was a real looker, you know, when she was younger. (laughs) And so ever since then, this has been a few weeks ago, ever since then, this word, and I may have previously mentioned this on another episode, but this word smoke show kept coming up for me. And immediately I thought, uh, you know, I need to look this word up. And uh, I just, you know, looked it up. And it talked about that it's uh, a slang for someone who is physically attractive. And immediately I began to think about how the scripture tells us in Isaiah 53, when talking about Jesus, it specifically says that uh, we did not esteem him uh, as someone uh, having real worth and that he was someone that men actually would hide their faces from. It says that He was wounded that we might be healed, that he was intimately acquainted with all of our griefs, pains, sicknesses, diseases. Uh, In verse 2, it says, uh, he has no former uh, royal pomp or look that we should uh, look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Now, how many of you know how often Uh, We try to make Jesus a smoke show. We try to make him physically attractive. Uh, And oftentimes people will think of Jim Caviezel, I think is the actor's name, who portrayed Jesus in The Passion of the Christ, okay, who was uh, a good-looking Jesus, uh, and just the whole way he carried himself. And I know that oftentimes we're attempting to present Jesus as we see him in our mind's eye oftentimes. But according to the scripture, he was no smoke show. He was not physically attractive. It was not going to be his physical appearance or some kind of royal kingly pomp and circumstance that would draw people to him. Uh, It was something far greater than that. The favor of the Father upon him. That... God uh, had anointed him to save the entire world. But in doing so, he was no smoke show. He was not physically attractive. It actually tells us in places in the scripture that he became unrecognizable 
And I submit to you that's not just because of the physical beatings, but because as he was becoming sin and ultimately became sin, uh, he definitely was marred, mauled, uh, deformed, if you will, um, because sin definitely makes us unrecognizable. And he became and took on the sin of the entire world, of every person that's ever lived. Hebrews 2 9 tells us he has tasted death and experienced death for every single person. And I can remember, and I know I've shared this before, but I can remember a day when I was so uh, covered in shame and so sickened uh, by self and how it had been allowed by me to live through me. Uh, and that shame was tangible. I could feel it upon me and uh, felt sickened even by my physical appearance. And it was, it was a rough and, and rotten day. Can I, can I tell you that? And not to be overly graphic or to be inappropriate, but I believe that I was, um, in a tub and was getting out of the bath and, and, and it was, it was just like, ugh. I mean, it was just, I'm not talking about, oh, like I'm having a bad hair day. I'm talking about, I am, you know, worthless. I make myself sick. And it was a very intense day. And Jesus leaned into me and he said, Nancy, what would you do if your father wrote down for everyone to read? He wasn't much to look at. And it caught me by surprise. And I said, what, Jesus? Because how many of you know? Jesus has to speak to you to awaken you out of your funk. Jesus has to pierce darkness with light, his words, to grip us and begin to walk us out of all of the filth of our own attempts at our goodness and righteousness and and the horrible place that that takes us to. Because if you trust in your goodness, if you live by your good, you're going to die by your bad. I mean, when it's good, it's good. When it's bad, it is really bad. And we aren't to live in either of those. We've been called into life with him. And so he's saying these words to me, and it startles me. And I come out of uh, my very deep place of darkness. And I say, what, Jesus? He says, what would you do, Nancy, if your father wrote down for everyone to read? He wasn't much to look at. There was never, not anything really about him that would draw you to him. And this was the scripture that he was referring to, and that immediately came to my mind. And he had this lilt in his voice when he said it, this laughter born of real freedom. And he said, yeah, my father wrote down for everybody... <laughs> that I wasn't much to look at. He said, but I did save the world. <laughs> and he and I laughed and cried and laughed and cried. And since that day, it's been a few years ago, since that day, shame has never had the same grip on me. Oh, it's tried, but it pretty much has to stand at the border of my life and try to cry out and catcall. It doesn't get to come into my life. Because when Jesus shared that with me, he was letting me know he was no smoke show. His life wasn't lived because he had this outer beauty, uh, that he was so good looking, people were just, you know, lustfully drawn to him. No, there was none of that. It says this of him. There was no form or comeliness that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected and forsaken, abandoned by men, a man of sorrows and pains and diseases, and acquainted with grief and sickness. And like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we did not appreciate his worth or have any esteem for him. Surely he has borne our griefs, sicknesses, weaknesses, and diseases, and carried our sorrows and pains of punishment. Yet we ignorantly considered him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God, as if 
with leprosy, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and iniquities, the chastisement needful to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him, and with the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. My friends, Jesus was no physical smoke show, but let me say this. He was the greatest spiritual smoke show there has ever been. He is the best-looking, handsome, magnificent, fantastic, fabulous, amazingly and terrifyingly beautiful Son of God, Son of Man. There is no one like him. He's the greatest spiritual smoke show there has ever been. He is the one and only. Look upon him, my friends. Hebrews 12 says, look away from everything that would distract. Look away from everything that would distract and look unto him. Consider him. Can you go with me to Hebrews 12? Let's make sure that we read this because all throughout the scripture, my friends, in in every book of the Bible, Jesus is referenced. Jesus is before, during, and after everything. He is everything. The supremacy of Jesus Christ is coming, my friends, onto the stage of the world. And I pray through you and me that he will be seen, known, and manifested. Oh, there's a great cloud of witnesses, right, that surround us. But Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith. He gives the first incentive for our belief, and also he's its finisher, bringing it to maturity and perfection. He is the one for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him. He's the one who endured the cross, despising and ignoring the shame, and he is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, just think of him. Just think of him who endured from sinners such grievous opposition and bitter hostility against himself. Reckon it up and consider it all in comparison with your trials, so that you may not grow weary or exhausted, losing heart and relaxing and fainting in your minds. You have not yet struggled and fought agonizingly against sin, nor have you yet resisted and withstood to the point of pouring out your own blood. And have you completely forgotten the divine word of appeal and encouragement in which you are reasoned with and addressed as sons? My son, do not think lightly or scorn to submit to the correction and discipline of the Lord, nor lose courage and give up and faint when you are reproved or corrected by him. For the Lord corrects and disciplines everyone whom he loves, and he punishes, even scourges, every son whom he accepts and welcomes to his heart and cherishes. You must submit to and endure correction for discipline. God is dealing with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not train and correct and discipline? Now, if you are exempt from correction and left without discipline, in which all of God's children share, then you are illegitimate offspring and not true sons at all. Moreover, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we yielded to them and respected them for training us. Shall we not much more cheerfully submit to the Father of spirits and so truly live? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for only a short period of time and chastised us as seemed proper and good to them. But he disciplines us for our certain good, that we might become sharers in his own holiness. For the time being, no discipline brings joy, but seems grievous and painful. But afterwards... I declare there is an afterwards, my friends, but afterwards it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it, a harvest of fruit which consists in righteousness, 
in conformity to God's will and purpose, thought and action, resulting in right living and right standing with God. So then, brace up. Ooh, I see another smoke show about to come. The smoke show of sons who are in Christ, of Christ, and will walk as Christ. There is a smoke show about to come that's not about physical beauty, but it is about a spiritual display of our oneness with Him. Verse 12, So then brace up and reinvigorate and set right your slackened and weakened and drooping hands and strengthen your feeble and palsied and tottering knees and cut through and make firm and plain and smooth straight paths for your feet. Yes, make them safe and upright and happy paths that go in the right direction. This is a part of what Jesus meant when he said to Peter, You know, Peter, Satan's, you know, asked to sift you like wheat, but now I'm praying for you. And that afterwards, Peter, now when you turn, strengthen the brethren. Set them resolutely in the right direction. So that the lame and halting limbs may not be put out of joint, but rather may be cured. Strive to live in peace with everybody and pursue that consecration and holiness without which no one will ever see the Lord. Verse 16, exercise foresight. Come on, my friends, look ahead. There's a smoke show coming of the sons of God. Exercise foresight and be on the watch to look after one another, to see that no one falls back from and fails to secure God's grace. In order that no root of resentment, rancor, bitterness, or hatred shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment, and then the many become contaminated and defiled by it, that no one may become guilty of sexual vice or become a profane, godless, and sacrilegious person, as Esau did, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you understand that later on, when he wanted to regain title to his inheritance of the blessing, he was rejected, disqualified, and set aside, for he could find no opportunity to repair by repentance what he had done, no chance to recall the choice he had made, although he sought for it carefully with bitter tears. For you have not come, as did the Israelites in the wilderness, to a material mountain that can be touched, a mountain that is ablaze with fire, and to gloom and darkness and a raging storm, and to the blast of a trumpet and a voice whose words make the listeners beg that nothing more be said to them. For they could not bear the command that was given. If even a wild animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. In fact, so awful and terrifying was the phenomenal sight that Moses said, I am terrified, aghast, and trembling with fear. Verse 22, now here's our mountain, my friends. Here's our smoke show. Verse 22, it says, but rather you have come to Mount Zion, even to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless multitudes of angels in festal gathering, and to the church, the assembly of the firstborn, who are registered as citizens in heaven, and to the God who is judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous, the redeemed in heaven, who have been made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator, the go-between, the agent of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of mercy." a better and nobler and more gracious message than the blood of Abel, which cried out for vengeance. Verse 25, So see to it that you do not reject him or refuse to listen to and heed him who is speaking to you now. I'm going to stop there. My friends, Jesus was no physical smoke show. You're not meant to be some physical smoke show. There's not just a physical smoke show coming. My friends, we are born of the greatest spiritual smoke show there's ever been. The greatest, kindest, most perfect, attractive, beautiful, handsome Jesus. We are born of him and we will look like him if we are willing to yield to the discipline of the Father. Oh, he's going to bring forth some good-looking sons. And we are going to be those who are of him. And there is going to be an open display of him. And many, many will be drawn to him through us as we simply live out our life in him. So, my friends, whatever you might look like today, 
You might look horrible. You might look magnificent. But please do not lean into your physical advantages, uh, your um, heritage, naturally speaking. Do not lean upon your pedigree or lack thereof. My friends, Jesus wasn't much to look at, but he sure did save the world. I'm going to say what he says. I'm going to live as who I am in the spirit, though my body may be aging, my friends. My new man is being renewed daily and is fresh, fresh in life. Come on, my friends, let's live in the greatest spiritual smoke show there has ever been, will ever be. Let's live as who we are unto him. I love you all. For more information on Nancy, please visit nancymccrady.com or follow her on social media at nbmccrady.com.